Hello, wonderful staff of the Northwest Kidney Center. Uh, today we're going to talk about needle stick injuries. This is a common problem in dialysis units. In one study in Hungary, for example, 83% of workers had at least one needle stick injury during their professional career. Uh, needle stick injuries are also underreported. Uh, in another study from Nigeria, 40% of the dialysis staff had a needle stick injury in the career but only a third of those actually reported it to their manager. There are three objectives to today's talk. Understand the risks of acquiring infection following a needle stick injury. Be familiar with the pathogens that can be transmitted by needle stick injuries. And most importantly, know what to do if you get stuck with a needle. Let's begin by discussing the pathogens that can be transmitted to a healthcare worker through exposure to blood or the so-called blood-borne pathogens. There are many pathogens out there that can be transmitted to healthcare providers following exposure to blood or body fluids. Uh, the most important of these are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Today we'll <clears throat> focus on the transmission and prevention of these three viruses, although it's important to recognize that there are more than 30 different pathogens um, that have been documented, uh, occupational infection hazards uh, following exposure to blood or body fluids in healthcare personnel. Uh, the main occupational risk for acquiring a bloodborne pathogen uh, is a percutaneous sharps injury uh, with a contaminant object, so uh, like a needle injury. The CDC estimates that there are about 385,000 sharps related injuries that occur annually among healthcare professionals and hospitals and other medical institutions, but this is probably an underestimate uh, because underreporting of exposures is a big problem, even in institutions that provide easily accessible reporting systems. Uh, nurses have the greatest risk for uh, needle stick injuries and it's highest in dialysis units. So hemodialysis healthcare workers are twice as likely to sustain a high risk needle stick injury uh, than uh, nurses and techs in other settings. Um, why do needle stick injuries occur? Well, a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, in a study conducted at five academic medical centers, fatigue associated with long work hours and sleep deprivation was associated with a threefold increased risk of needle stick injuries. So in other words, we work long shifts, we get tired, we make mistakes. The healthcare facilities where we work have a responsibility mandated by OSHA to undertake measures to reduce occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. So of course, uh, they have to provide us with personal protective equipment, uh, including gloves and face shields. Uh, we should be using uh, needles with guards as we do at our dialysis unit. Uh, of course, we should have sharps containers that are impervious to, uh, to needle uh, pokes. Um, and of course, we should always employ what we call standard or formerly known as universal precautions when taking care of all patients. We, sh we should assume that all patients have every infection under the sun uh, and um, take the utmost precautions uh, in every patient that we work with to avoid needle stick injuries. So if you get stuck with a needle, what exactly is your risk of acquiring an infection? So a healthcare professional's risk of acquiring infection uh, as a result of occupational exposure depends on several factors. Um, one of the most important ones is the prevalence of the infectious agent in the general population. So for example, uh, dialysis patients have a much higher rate of hepatitis C than the general population. So the risk of hepatitis uh, C transmission in a dialysis unit is higher, say, than at a hospital or other clinic. Um, also depends on the frequency of exposure. So, you know, how often do we actually cannulate uh, a dialysis fistula? And it depends on the nature of the exposure and the efficiency of transmission. So, uh, for example, some uh, viruses are transmitted a lot more easily than others through a needle stick injury. One of the pathogens that is most easy to transmit in a needle stick injury is hepatitis B. This is a viral infection that affects the liver and can cause both acute and chronic infection. It's transmitted by exposure to infectious blood or body fluids. 
Fortunately, the prevalence, which used to be really high in dialysis units, uh, has fallen ever since vaccination was made available in 1982. How easy it is to transmit the virus depends on uh, whether or not the donor or the patient with the hepatitis B has both uh, the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen and something called the hepatitis B envelope antigen, which is another envelope protein that is uh, uh, expressed um, during rapid uh, replication of the virus. So if you have a lot of envelope angelin, antigen in your blood, uh, this is a virus that is frequently replicating. So those who have both the antigen, service antigen as well as the envelope antigen are most infectious. So what is the risk of hepatitis B from a needle stick? Well, um, the rate of seroconversion, that is actually developing uh, serologic evidence of hepatitis B infection uh, uh, can uh, depend, as I said, on the presence or absence of the envelope antigen. So if you have both the surface antigen and the envelope an antigen present in the donor patient, then the risk of seroconversion is anywhere from one third to two thirds. So if you get poke with one needle and you've got anywhere from a 37 to a 62% chance of acquiring hepatitis B. On the other hand, if you only have uh, the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen in the patient and not the envelope antigen, the risk is lower, uh, about 23 to 37%. But still, over a third of uh, patient, a third of healthcare workers who get picked by someone uh, with hepatitis B surface antigen in their blood will serologically convert to hepatitis B. What's the risk of clinical hepatitis? That is, you know, having symptomatic clinical disease like with jaundice and other symptoms. Uh, that's 22 to 31% if the source patient has both hepatitis B surface antigen and envelope antigen, or it's one to 6% if the source patient has only the hepatitis B surface antigen in the blood. As an aside, hepatitis B is a tenacious virus. It can be transmitted um, not only through needle stick injuries, but just by contact with uh, fomites or basically inert surfaces, uh, glucometers, um, countertops, doorknobs. Uh, hepatitis B can survive on countertops for seven days and during that period remains capable of causing infection. That said, despite the very high risk of transmission, the number of hepatitis B infections among healthcare professionals has declined precipitously over the last 30 years. Um, uh, it used to be uh, in 1983, there were about 17,000 cases of transmission to healthcare workers per year, uh, compared in 2010 where there were only 263. Uh, why is hepatitis B an uncommon uh, hospital acquired or dialysis unit acquired infection because of hepatitis B vaccination. Another virus that can be easily transmitted through a needle stick injury is hepatitis C. Uh, this is uh, an infectious virus that also affects the liver, therefore it's a form of viral hepatitis. Uh, it's spread primarily by blood-to-blood -blood contact associated with injection drug use, so Lots and lots, very high prevalence of hepatitis C among IV drug users, uh, but you can also get it uh, from poorly sterilized medical equipment, uh, needle stick injuries, uh, and transfusions used to be a common uh, source of infection among the general population. Uh, interestingly, hepatitis C is more common in the dialysis population than in the general population. Uh, these are data from something called the Dialysis Outcome Practice, uh, practice pattern study of the DOPS data, which is a large international multi-center trial that collects observational data on dialysis patients. And internationally, the prevalence of hepatitis C among dialysis patients is about 10% compared to about 3% of the general population internationally. So what is the risk of hepatitis C transmission from a needle stick? Well, fortunately, it's a lot lower than hepatitis B. According to CDC estimates, uh, the average incidence of hepatitis C seroconversion is about 1.8% after a needle stick injury. Um, as an aside, similar to hepatitis B, hepatitis C is a tenacious virus. It can remain infectious for long, prolonged periods of time on inanimate surfaces at room temperature for several weeks. That's why we use a lot of bleach in our dialysis units. 
A third important virus that can be transmitted from a needle stick injury is the human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, there are actually two species of lentiviruses, which are a subgroup of the retroviruses that can affect humans. Uh, and over time, they uh, wear down the immune system to the point that people develop a condition called Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. Um, and that's a condition in which uh, there is progressive failure of the immune system, allowing for patients to succumb to opportunistic or unusual infections, as well as cancer. Without treatment, the average survival for a patient with HIV is about 9 to 11 years, depending on the subtype. So what's the risk of acquiring HIV infection from a needle stick? Well, uh, like hepatitis C, it's a lot lower than hepatitis B. And in part, it depends on the type of exposure. So if someone gets poked um, uh, with a needle from a patient who has a really high viral load, so lots of virus, high concentration of virus in the blood, and it's a large volume needle, so there's a lot of blood in the tip, and they get poked deep in the skin, the exposure is deep, uh, then that's a high risk uh, uh, situation. So the healthcare professionals at highest risk for transmission, transmission are those who've been inoculated uh, with blood from a source patient who is not on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, uh, and in particular has a detectable viral load. Still, the overall risk of transmission in the United States is low. According to CDC data, between the years 1985 and 2013, there were 58 confirmed and 150 possible cases of occupationally acquired HIV infection. And between 2000 and 2012, there was only one confirmed case. So the risk of acquiring HIV from a needle stick injury is actually very low. Uh, and a further comforting data comes from a study uh, published in 1990 uh, that was that looked at the risk of transmission prior to the introduction of what we call highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart therapy, basically uh, medications to treat HIV. An HIV transmission occurred in only 20 of 6,000 cases for a uh, risk of uh, acquiring HIV of only 0.33% following a needle stick injury. All right, moving on to part three, let's discuss post-exposure management. Uh, that is, uh, what should you do in the event that you sustain a needle stick injury? The first and maybe most important step is immediately cleaning the exposed site, the puncture site, with soap and water. It's perfectly fine to also use an antiseptic, such as an alcohol-based hand hygiene agent. Um, so, you know, all of these viruses are susceptible to um, alcohol and other antiseptics like iodine and chlorhexidine. So they all inactivate viruses, but uh, the efficacy of these agents in preventing transmission of infection is unknown. So there, there are no data to suggest that if you use chlorhexidine or alcohol, uh, your risk of uh, transmission is lower, but it's perfectly fine to use it. But the most important thing to do is just first wash it really, really well uh, with soap and water. The next step is to report the injury uh, to nurse manager uh, and then obtain information <clears throat> about the person who got poked with the needle. So specifically, you want to record the date, the time, and the body location of exposure and then you want to look at when that healthcare professional was vaccinated with hepatitis B. Uh, specifically, uh, did that person complete the series? And uh, more importantly, did the person respond to the vaccine? So that's why we check a post-immunization quantitative titer. So it's really good to know if you responded to the vaccine series and what your titer was. Um, and it's also good to know if you've ever been tested previously for hepatitis B or HIV or a hepatitis C virus. Uh, and then finally, because you got poked with the needle, it's good to know your tetanus immunization status because every 10 years we like to give a tetanus, vac uh, tetanus toxoid vaccine. The next step is to obtain information about the source patient. So you want to know a person's hepatitis B and C status, and that's useful because that's something that we check uh, well, the hepatitis C we check annually, hepatitis B we check every six months. Uh, we actually don't check HIV routinely, and so <clears throat> that's not readily uh, available information uh, at our dialysis unit, unfortunately. 
Now, if the healthcare professional completed the three-dose vaccine hepatitis B series and responded uh, such that his or her hepatitis B service antibody was greater than 10 uh, milli international units per mil, then that person's immune. There's almost no chance of getting hepatitis B through needle stick injury. So you really only need to check the donor uh, patient for hepatitis C and HIV. But if we don't know whether or not the healthcare professional uh, mounted an appropriate antibody response, then you want to check the patient for hepatitis B surface antigen as well. The next step is to consider administration of the hepatitis B immunoglobulin, which would have to be done in an emergency department. So if you get a needle stick injury and you're not sure if you responded to the vaccine series, it's not documented, you don't have your records, uh, and you are working with a patient who might have hepatitis B, which could be anyone, particularly, of course, if you're working in the hepatitis isolation area, although in that case, uh, you probably should have known your hepatitis B uh, responder status. But, you know, even in the general population, uh, dialysis population, someone, you know, we check them every six months for hepatitis B service antigen, but, you know, if they went out and did IV drugs or something like that, I mean, they could acquire hepatitis B uh, in the interim. So basically, we have to assume that someone has hepatitis B. Um, and so if you don't know your immune, whether or not you're immune, then you have to go to the emergency room for administration of hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Basically, it's a human immunoglobulin that's used to prevent the development of hepatitis B, and it's used for treatment of acute exposure to hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, it's indicated as post-exposure prophylaxis for people at risk of developing hepatitis B uh, through exposure, um, and it does a good job of providing temporary immunity by the transfer of immunoglobulins to hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, and it lasts for three to six months. Uh, it's typically given intramuscularly. Uh, and you can have local reactions as well as, you know, systemic reactions of uh, malaise and headaches and muscle pain and nausea and stuff. Um, the hepatitis B Immunoglobulin should ideally be administered within 24 hours exposure, but if it's not possible, it can be given within seven days. Uh, it's estimated to be about 75% effective in preventing hepatitis B infection. Uh, and as I said, administration depends on the patient status and uh, the healthcare professional's immune status. So if healthcare professional is immune to hepatitis B, they certainly do not need it. If the patient is documented hepatitis B surface antigen negative, uh, then you do not need to give the hepatitis B immunoglobulin. So to recap, if a healthcare professional is immune to hepatitis B, so has a documented hepatitis B surface antigen antibody greater than 10, micro international units per mil, then the hepatitis B immunoglobulin is not needed. When is it needed? Well, if the patient has hepatitis B surface antigen and the healthcare professional is not immune, either didn't respond or unknown if responder was never vaccinated, then the healthcare professional should receive two doses of hepatitis B immunoglobulin one month bar. So we'd send the healthcare professional to the emergency room, they get one dose, they get a follow-up dose uh, a month later, and then that person should be checked for uh, hepatitis B uh, six months after exposure to see if there's evidence of serologic conversion. Now, if the patient does not have hepatitis B, so we check them, no hepatitis B, and the healthcare professional finds out that he or she is not immune, say he didn't respond to the initial uh, vaccine series, then the healthcare professional should be revaccinated, uh, and then you retest them for hepatitis uh, uh, one to two months later. Uh, and if you know one to two months later the hepatitis B surface antibody is still low, then you should basically complete the series, give them two more hepatitis B shots over a six-month period. There's always a risk of acquiring hepatitis C uh, in a dialysis unit, particularly through a needle stick injury. Uh, first step is to check the patient for hepatitis C, and that's something that we do annually uh, in our dialysis patients. Um, if, but they would need to be rechecked again, particularly if they are known to use intravenous drugs, we would also check the hepatitis C virus RNA level, uh, which tells you whether or not they have active virus in their bloodstream. Um, 
We, of course, would check the healthcare professional for a hepatitis C antibody, preferably within 48 hours after exposure. And again, this is typically done in the emergency room. Um, if uh, the patient has hepatitis C, then we're gonna check the healthcare professional at three to six weeks, and again, four to six months after exposure. When would we expect a healthcare professional to seroconvert? Well, it typically takes eight to 11 weeks after the initial exposure. Um, there are some very good direct acting antivirals uh, against hepatitis C these days. Uh, they're like 95% in curing uh, chronic hepatitis C, but at present there are insufficient data to recommend the use for post-exposure prophylaxis. I think this may change in the future, but currently we don't give people uh, hepatitis C virus uh, antiviral medication um, when they've been exposed to someone with hepatitis C. If the healthcare professional develops hepatitis C, uh, then they would have to be referred to either an infectious disease specialist or a gastroenterologist uh, for treatment of the hepatitis C. And as I said, we have very good uh, direct acting antivirals to treat hepatitis C these days. There's always a risk of HIV transmission from a needle stick injury. Uh, and unlike hepatitis B and hepatitis C, we don't routinely check people for HIV. So uh, un undoubtedly some of our patients have HIV and they've just never been tested and we just don't know. Uh, but the initial action is very important uh, following potential exposure. First, you have to determine the HIV status of the patient. If that's not known from chart review, then in an expedited fashion, we check them for hepatitis or for HIV infection. If the source patient has HIV, uh, then you want to go through the record to find out their most recent viral load. So how many viruses they have uh, in their blood, so the concentration of virus. You wanna look at their antiretroviral treatment therapy. Are they taking uh, medications for HIV? Uh, do they have a history of drug resistance? Unlike for the hepatitis C virus, we have uh, very good post-exposure prophylaxis medications, or PEP, uh, that we administer to healthcare professionals after a needle stick injury. Um, the use of antiretroviral drugs after a uh, single high-risk event to stop HIV seroconversion is effective, uh, but you want to give it ideally within two hours and always within 72 hours of a possible exposure. So timing is important. Um, there was a study uh, published years ago that showed that uh, a medication called zidovudine alone, just by itself, reduced the risk of HIV infection after needle stick injury by 80%. And these days we have uh, much more effective current multi-drug regimens that are likely much better in preventing infection. They're better tolerated and they are the current standard of care. If the testing of the source patient is delayed for whatever reason, then you should just start someone on post-exposure prophylaxis while awaiting the test results. Uh, if the patient has known HIV, uh, then it's very important uh, to identify um, uh, the HIV infection, to review with the healthcare professional the adverse effects of the post-exposure prophylaxis if administered. Uh, you want to check um, the healthcare professional for HIV at baseline and then at six weeks and again at four months. Uh, the recommended duration of treatment with post-exposure prophylaxis is four weeks, although honestly the optimal duration is not known. Uh, and of course it can be stopped sooner if uh, the source patient is HIV negative. Um, so symptoms to watch for with acute HIV infection uh, typically occur two to four weeks after exposure and they can include fever, swelling of lymph nodes, sore throat, muscle aches, joint aches, diarrhea, headaches, nausea, vomiting, rash, ulcers, uh, and if the infection has been going a long time, weight loss is a common symptom. All right, now let's summarize what we've learned. So in summary, the risk that a healthcare professional will acquire a bloodborne pathogen from a needle stick depends on uh, first the prevalence of the infectious agent. So how common is hepatitis B or HIV or hep C in the dialysis population? Also depends on the nature of exposure, like was it a really deep needle stick or not? And of course the availability of pre and post exposure prophylaxis, which in uh, our community is uh, widely available. 
Uh, Pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, is available for hepatitis B, i.e. immunization. So all healthcare professionals should be immunized against hepatitis B virus. Uh, there's no pre-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis C or HIV infection because we don't have vaccines that are effective against them. After a needle stick injury, the skin should be washed with soap and water. It's perfectly fine to use alcohol or chlorhexidine, although the benefit is uncertain. Post-exposure prophylaxis with the hepatitis B vaccine and or immunoglobulin should be administered to a healthcare professional who is not immune to the hepatitis B virus and gets poked uh, with a needle uh, from a patient uh, that has hepatitis B. Um, Antiretroviral medication should be given to healthcare professionals uh, if the patient has HIV or if the HIV status is unknown. So we just assume everyone has hepatitis B. If you get poked with a needle, you should go to the ER and you should receive uh, uh, antiretroviral medication until the HIV status of that patient is clear. Uh, and finally, there is no post-exposure prophylaxis for persons exposed to hepatitis C blood but we do have very effective treatments. So if you have the misfortune of acquiring hepatitis C from a needle stick injury, 95% uh, of the time we can treat it with uh, a very effective course of medication. All right, everyone, it is now quiz time, i.e. time to see if you are paying attention. Question number one, in the setting of a needle stick injury in a dialysis unit, who should receive hepatitis B immunoglobulin? That's right. Um, a healthcare professional who is not immune or if the immune status is unknown and if the patient's hepatitis B virus status is positive. Question number two. You get stuck with a needle and the patient has known hepatitis C. What post-exposure prophylaxis should be used? That's right. There is no post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis C. There is for a a HIV and there is for hepatitis B, but not for hepatitis C. Question number three, you're cannulating an HIV positive dialysis patient and a needle pokes your finger. How quickly should you ideally start taking post-exposure prophylaxis? right within two hours so it's one of those situations where you don't pass go you just go straight to the emergency room you explain the situation and they give you a prescription for the antiretroviral therapy question number four you suffer a needle stick injury your co-worker tells you to suck your finger wound what do you do That's right, you clean it with soap and water, maybe alcohol, but don't suck the wound. Final question, of the three viruses we discussed today, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, which is the most infectious, i.e. the easiest to contract from a needle stick? That's right, uh, hepatitis B by far. Uh, again, if they have both the surface antigen and the envelope antigen, up to you know, two thirds of healthcare professionals uh, could acquire the infection through a single needle stick. This includes the July 2023 in-service for the Northwest Kidney Center. Thank you for your excellent care of our patients and thank you for your attention. Hope you have a great rest of your month. This is Andy Brokenbro signing out until next month. Have a great day.